You are listening to the Catholic Exchange Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Catholic Exchange Podcast. This is your editor and host, Michael Litchens, here with Sister Teresa Alethea. She is a media nun. I follow her on Twitter and have pretty much since I got on that website. And it's She's one of the bright spots of Twitter, and that really is saying something. She's a media nun, ex-atheist, and recently a Memento Mori celebrity. So, Sister Teresa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me on, Michael. It's my pleasure. And I kind of gave away the game at our short intro. We're talking about Memento Mori. And I think the best definition I could come to this was an example from your Twitter feed this morning, where you said, St. Philip Neri spent his last days on earth hearing confessions and saying mass. As he went to bed that night, he said something he had said so many times throughout his life. Last of all, we must die. That kind of gives you a context for this really ancient, wonderful Catholic tradition that is sort of forgotten by now. So, Sister Teresa, to kind of give out people an idea, what exactly... In the best summation you can, what is Memento Mori, and how do you get interested in promoting it? So it kind of all started when I read that our founder of uh, my religious order, which is the Daughters of St. Paul, Blessed James mm-hmm. Alberione, kept a skull in his desk. <laughs> and I read that when I, um, right before I entered the convent, and I thought, at the time, I thought, that's super metal, I'm going to do that at some point, but then I just forgot about it, and I didn't really mm-hmm. think about it. But then um, last fall, I just felt uh, urged by God to consider doing it again. And I actually saw a priest who carries or carried around a little skull with him to, as a memento mori. And I thought to myself, wow, that's unusual. Um, and it reminded me of our founder, Blessed James. And so mm-hmm. I mentioned it at table to the sisters. And one of the sisters says, oh, I have a little ceramic skull you could use to put on your desk. And so... I put it on my desk, and the first day I tweeted about it, I just thought the reason I did that was honestly because I thought, I'm going to put this on my desk and I'm going to forget about it. So I probably should just tweet about it like every day for a couple weeks. Oh, my Um, goodness. (laughs) And a couple weeks turned into, you know, over 500 days. But as I was in that journey, I I learned a a lot more about this tradition in the church, and it's a beautiful, beautiful tradition that – you know, uh, people point to medieval times of a memento mori, you know, you would find memento moris in, in paintings and just sim- symbols of death, um, skulls, and you'd see the word memento mori all over um, mm-hmm. medieval churches. But this really goes back to the beginning of salvation history when God says to Adam and Eve, you're dust, and to dust you shall return. And on Ash Wednesday, we hear that phrase, remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And there are these exhortations to remember our death all throughout Scripture. Um, really, I, it, it never really hit me until I started to meditate on death. And I was reading the daily readings in, for Mass, and, and it's almost every day I find something in the Psalms, in the Gospel, that are a reminder to think about your, your mortality, about the fact that our lives end, that we are finite creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Jesus has saved us from death through the cross. But really, meditation on death helps us to enter into that mystery and help, has helped me to enter into that mystery and really for it to, to hit home and enter into my spiritual life and make a difference in, in my daily concrete action. Like, in what way do you think uh, Memento Mori helps us to focus more on our daily prayers or meditations exactly? I... <clears throat> Well, first of all, I think I think a lot of people do not think of their death, I, and no. I know that I didn't either, because it's an unpleasant thought. <laughs> so we like we like to keep that thought out of our mind, but but really, mm-hmm. it's kind of I think it's running under the surface of a lot of things that we do, and it, and it's a fear. You know, when I started to meditate on death, I I, I felt some anxiety when I first started because thinking about death is is quite unpleasant and thinking about your death is extremely unpleasant. And so thinking about that every single day was a, it was a little jarring at first. But but as I as I did it, I, I realized that it was helping me to make make better decisions in view of holiness. Mm-hmm. And you know, Saint Ignatius, he he 
says in, um, in his exercises, he encourages people to think about them on, on to think if you're, if you're going to make a decision, he says, think of yourself on your deathbed and, and just imagine yourself there and then, and then make the decision based on that, based on like the end of your life. What would you want to have done on your deathbed? What would you want to have done in this situation? And hmm. that really, it really hones your choices. <laughs> and it helps me to be more focused on, on holiness right now. Because of what a lot of the church fathers, many of them, over and over, they say, death is inevitable and unpredictable. We do not mm. know when it's going to come. So we can imagine ourselves on our deathbed when we're 80 years old, but that won't help if we die in a car accident tomorrow. And so that's something that we have to really be prepared for. So preparation for death is not something that you you say, oh, I'll just wait until I'm retired and I'll start doing that. It's, it's something that we all have to do because we never know when it's going to come. And I think that's the bluntest way we can put it, and it's something many, many saints bring up over and over again. And I, oh, my favorite painter is Caravaggio, as many of our listeners know, and it's something that he plays around with, especially with the saints often looking at skulls. And this is actually leading me to a question that our readers ask us. Are the saints all depicted with skulls because so many of them thought of death, or is that a tradition that was really more introduced in the Middle Ages? I don't know the art history aspect of it, but mm -hmm. I do know from from investigating the saints' writings that I have not found a saint who doesn't talk about this. <laughs> wow. Yeah, to be blunt, I really have every, you know, it's funny because I, for a while when I was tweeting every day, I was like, what am I going to tweet today? And I, and so I'd look for the saint of the day and I'd look, I'd look into their, something that they had written and I'd try to find a quote on death mm -hmm. and, it, and really it, it was not difficult every single time. So the saints and, and I, I included in my Lenten devotional every single day has a reflection for me on the readings of the day, but then mm -hmm. I included writings from the saints, like, throughout history. You know, the early church fathers talk about it a lot, but I have, I have um, excerpts from Elizabeth Ann Seton. She wrote, wrote in her letters about meditating on death. Mm -hmm. um, St. John Vianney, uh, Therese, all of the saints that I have found talk about this. And I think, I think it's really because it gets to the core of, of what the gospel is about. And I think they all used it as a tool in their spiritual lives to really focus mm -hmm. on the end and focus on union with God. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, she has a letter where she says, we see the true value of things by the light of eternity. And uh, meditating on our death is what helps us to see our life by the light of, of eternity. I see that. And uh, going back to that devotional journal that we are having coming out of Memento Mori, a Lenten devotional coming out January 13th at Amazon. What specifically about death allows us to enter into the Lenten journey? Well, like I mentioned on Ash Wednesday, you know, when the priest traces the ashes on your forehead and he says, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. I think that that's, it's, you know, it. What I say in the devotional is Lent is a memento mori journey, and, and that's what, what we're reminded of on Ash Wednesday. And so many people go to Ash Wednesday Mass, even though it's not a holy day of obligation. You know, pe people go to Ash Wednesday Mass who don't go to holy days of obligations because there's something so, so really um, intense about that moment of ashes on your forehead. And, and I think it's, be, it's because we're reminded of our death, and many of us don't think about it many other days. And so mm -hmm. I think in that journey, that is, um, it, the beginning of it is remember that you tended towards death, and towards, uh, through your sin, you, uh, you, your, your life could have ended in death, and that could have been the final end of your, de of your life. Uh, but Jesus has saved us from that. So he has opened the doors to eternity for us. But in order to really understand what he has saved us from, we have to understand what death is. And we have to meditate on what, what is that practically? What, like, what does that mean? It means I'm going to die at the end of my life. And 
that's good news because Jesus died on the cross. That would not have been good news if Jesus had not died on the cross. So it kind of brings the good news of Jesus' death on the cross and it, and it kind of heightens it and magnifies it. And so Lent is a perfect time for that because to meditate on, it, to, uh, to meditate on your death throughout Lent and to end with mm-hmm. Easter, I think, I think people, I'm really hoping that people will make that journey and, and see it make concrete changes in their life like I have. This also leads into the good news that I know you've talked about this in writing, but in thinking about death and then thinking about what that means when our Lord endures death, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, How does thinking about death bring us closer to understanding Christ's death? I think meditating on our own death is is interlinked with meditation on death. And I, one person once asked me in an interview, well, sister, why don't you just look at a crucifix? And I think that's, that, that is actually a beautiful memento mori, um, part of memento mori. But for me, meditating on my own death has helped me to understand what Christ did for me because I haven't died. <laughs> and so I don't know what that, what that means really. But, medit- but meditating on my own death kind of brings home what Jesus did for me, because it's easier for me to think about kind of about how that would impact me, because I'm me and I'm not Jesus. So when, you, when I think about my mm-hmm. own death, I'm able to enter into Jesus's dying for me and, and realizing like what exactly that was. And also realizing that through my baptism, I enter into Jesus' death. Mm-hmm. And, and through that, I receive the grace of eternal life. So I think meditation on our own death is very much intertwined with meditation on Jesus' death, which is why, why Lent is a perfect time to do it, because we're doing both at the same time, really, if we're doing it in a Christian way. That's a great answer to do both at the same time through Lent. Uh, there's going to be folks who will ask, I'm with you 100%. I have pictures of the great ossuary in Rome right next to my computer every day. But some people have said to me, well, isn't that kind of morbid to be thinking about death, to look at skulls? Isn't that just a little unhealthy and morbid? What's your general response to that? Yeah, you know, I hear that. I, I do hear that. And <clears throat> people are disturbed by the symbolism of a skull. And I understand that it's not everyone's thing, but for me, the reason, first of all, it's, we don't see it very, very much in our churches, but in churches in, in, in Europe, they're all over the place. So that's something that I remind people who, who say, who kind of raise concerns with me is that, that this, this actually is part of the tradition of the church. We just don't see it in the U.S. very much. And honestly, I, th- I think mm-hmm. it, we may have done that because we didn't want to weird out the Protestants more than necessary. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now I'm like, I don't, you know, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> I showed my Protestant family bones all over Rome when we went. I could, was so excited. Like, hey, we're in Siena. Let's go see St. Catherine of Siena. How did they feel about that? Initially, they were weirded out, but they thought it was actually kind of beautiful when you look at it. And that's what I always try to tell people, because when I went to Rome back when I was like 22, I went to the uh, Capuchin Ossuary in Rome, the most famous of the Bone Churches. And I was expected a freak show, but I found it to be a deeply spiritual moment. I was seeing people pray in the rosaries. I was getting this reminder from these skull monks reminding me that one day I was going to join them. And in a strange way, that's a beautiful moment, and I was glad to share that with the family, and I'm glad to share that with anyone, and it's why I'm so excited for this Lenten journal. Yeah, I, I, I think there's something, you know, when people tell me that the skulls are scary to them and upsetting, and I think that's, uh, that's because a lot of the skulls that we see in our culture are kind of Halloween skulls or, you know, horror movie <sighs> yeah. skulls, but... um. But as I've meditated on my death, the symbol of a skull, when I look at it on my desk, it's not something scary, it's something beautiful, because it starts to to remind me of, in a really concrete way, of the resurrection of the dead, which I think is something exactly. that people miss when they're creeped out by skulls, because <laughs> I remind them that, <laughs> that our skulls skulls, our bodies are going to physically be raised from the dead. And sometimes people don't realize that. 
they they yes. really don't believe, I think, or even know that we believe that our bodies will be raised and united with our souls at the end of time. Mm -hmm. And so the skull is not something that is representative of something that we leave behind and never see again. You know, our bodies will be raised and transformed into resurrected bodies. So th these physical things are are kind of a beautiful symbol of what Jesus has won for us. And bones, you know, it, it, just the tradition of relics in the church and, and venerating relics, it's, it's beautiful. We have this kind of really concrete, earthy, incarnational faith. We absolutely do. And actually, it's impressive how much of the memento mori tradition that we have in the church has begun to spread into the secular realm. Like, uh, Coco, of course, has something to do with that, I know, but... I don't know if you're familiar with the Order of the Good Death or the Death Positive yeah. Movement, mostly. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of parallel I see, but I'm fascinated that so many of them write about saints and our tradition and trying to talk about their own culture. Yeah, it is It is really fascinating. When I, when I started this, I kind of I, I didn't really know how many secular people were into it, but there's even st uh, modern-day Stoics who are really into Memento Mori and... Huh. Um, I recently did an interview with one of them, and so I, yeah, I, and I, I think that meditating on death is really useful for anyone. Uh, it, it can mm -hmm. help you to think my life, even you know, I used to be an atheist then, and I would have thought that meditating on death would would have been helpful to me then, because you think your life is is short. Oh. And it's going to end at a certain time. And so it helps to motivate you towards, hopefully, virtue. And, and the Stoics are definitely, that's, that's the purpose mm -hmm. of meditating on death. So that's, that's good. You know, that's good for anyone. But for a Christian, it's different. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just, it totally has a different perspective. And Jerome talks about this in one of his sermons. He talks about, you know, the philosophers, they meditate on death. And that's, you know, that's good. But for the Christian, mm -hmm. death has been transformed. So we're not just meditating on the physical reality of death. We're meditating on what Jesus has done for, for us, uh, as well as the physical reality of death. And that completely changes it. Yeah. I, so when I talk to, I, I definitely can connect with people who are, you know, thinking about death mm -hmm. and you know, using it in in a in a positive way to motivate themselves. But I think Christian meditation on death mm -hmm. is just a, it's a different thing in many ways. Yes. And what are some of the key differences you find in how a Christian meditates on death? Say a modern day Stoic or just somebody who believes in their job as a mortician is to be more death positive. What's the key difference? I think for the Stoic, and I think for um, for some secular death positive things, it's very focused on mm -hmm. death is a reality. We have to accept it. And for for the Christian, that's part of it. Death is a real reality. We have to accept it. But the fact mm -hmm. that 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 we're going to die is is just the beginning of our meditation on death. We that that's a very necessary and important part of it, and I think a lot of Christians miss that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they kind of skip right to the resurrection. They're, and I've heard this from people too, criticisms where they say, "Sister, you know, you're you're so focused on death, you need to focus on life." And and I say to them, "You have to understand." In order to understand life and resurrection, you have to understand death. And so a, a lot of us like to skip that. You know, you even see it in, in some churches where they have a resurrected Jesus, but they don't have a crucifix. And I, I, I don't agree mm -hmm. with that. I think it's very important that we, that we f begin with death. And because that's what Jesus did. He said, take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, we have to follow Jesus to the cross in order to really understand mm -hmm. the resurrection. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... It very much does, no. I think that's exactly it. When we're focusing on death as Christians, when I say I don't have an actual school, I'm not a school just yet, but I've, I keep images of death around me, namely the ossuaries and famous pictures of saints with their holding their skull or a few incorruptible bodies, and... I think it's important because we know this isn't the end. That skull will one day have flesh again and will be brought back to life. And one of the things I 
that really impressed my family was how many of the great Memento Mori images in Rome connected to Ezekiel that someday these bones will mm-hmm. rise again. And that, I think, is the greatest of Christian hopes. Yeah. Uh, that was probably me talking a little too much, not answering a question, but that's no. okay. No, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Going back to your journal, obviously you've gone through Lent uh, meditating on death. What was your Easter like after doing that for Lent? I think it just helped me to see Easter in a different way. Because before, you know, I I really mm-hmm. love Lent. I've loved it since I was a little kid. So I, I, I would oh. like take vows of silence and you know, like, do, do kind of extreme <laughs> things that, you know, that little kids do. But, mm-hmm. but I've always enjoyed the, the feeling of Lent of like the penitential feeling and the chain and the feeling that you get when at the end of Lent, I would always give up candy when I was little. And so at the end of Lent, I, I would be really strict about it, and, I'd, and then and then I'd eat all this candy, and so it was like this kind of penance and then joy. And I think people experience that, like like we we enter into this time of penance and then we exit into this time of joy. But I think for me, the memento mori has kind of helped it to become more than just this, this practice that brings me joy. And, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, I would think about the, the resurrection and Jesus's death, but I think Memento Mori brought it home for me. It brought it closer and it helped me to really mm-hmm. like enter into it in a personal way. You know, like I, 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 I always knew that Jesus died for me, but when I think about my own mm-hmm. death, I realize why he died for me. And so it's really just helped me to enter into the joy of Easter in a, a less superficial way. It's not just, oh, I can do that thing that I gave up now, or, or even just, oh, Jesus died for me, thank God. It, it's more like I, I know why Jesus died for me, and that it brings me this, this intense kind of light-filled joy that has helped me to understand the mystery of the cross and the resurrection and what Jesus has done for me personally. That's beautiful. And one question I always love to ask authors with a book coming out, what do you think was the most surprising or delightful thing you learned in writing this book? I think I realized how Memento Mori is really at the core of our faith. And Mm -hmm. I began, I began to see it everywhere, you know, not just in scripture, um, because I meditate on, on the readings of the day and, and I, I never had trouble finding a memento mori theme for any of the days. And, and then entering into all of the saints writings, just, just realizing, and I, I think that's really every great, you know, every great idea that people have that they, that they write about mm-hmm. really any idea that we write a book about when it has to do with our faith. It's, it's just one like facet of the diamond of truth that we're entering into. Mm-hmm. And so Memento Mori really is just one of those facets that just helps, helped me to enter into the Christian mystery. And I think it's, it's so helpful in the spiritual life. So I'm re- I'm really hoping that people will not just kind of think of this as a fad, get a skull for their desk and stop thinking about it, but really use this as a tool in their spiritual lives to grow closer to God and to become saints. That is a great goal to have for any book, absolutely. And final question before we end, of uh, if people want to find your book or learn more about you, where can they go? Yes, yeah, so they can find me on most forms of social media at Pursued by Truth. And then my website is Mm -hmm. also PursuedByTruth.com. And we'll put links to all that as well as to your book in our show notes as well on CatholicExchange.com. As always, please, if you're driving, don't start looking now. Wait till you get home. We'll have those in the notes. But Sister Andrea, so this has been a fantastic conversation, and I really appreciate that You've done so much work to bring back Memento Mori into this culture and uh, get us talking about it again. It's been a joy to follow you on social media, and I can't wait for this book. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And thank you. And to all you listeners, you can go to PursuedByTruth.com. Again, those links will be in the show notes. 
Follow her on Twitter, Instagram. It's well worth your time, and it's a great introduction to Memento Mori. I'll put links to the books, and if you have any other questions, editor at catholicexchange.com. We might do a few more episodes on Memento Mori. I certainly hope we can talk about it. But once again, thank you all. Have a lovely week. God love you.